He, uh, Hebrews chapter 3, if we can get John settled down over there. We'll get some order in this church. He's trying to make up for me. <laughs> no, we was, uh, Amazing Grace, just an uh, underrated song. We've sung, sung it so much, it's just, uh, really forget just how great that song is. Um, most of you probably already know this. John Newton, the man that wrote it, was an old shave, save, slave ship captain. He, he was a captain of a slave ship. One day a lot of water started coming in on the boat and he thought it was sinking. And he calls that the hour he first believed. And uh, years and years later when John Newton had gotten old, it's one of my favorite stories. He, he, pre he was a preacher also in England, and he, one of the last times he ever ste stepped in the pulpit, he was an old man, and they said he hobbled up the aisle and got up behind the pulpit and looked out over the congregation and said, he said, I'm old now and have forgotten most of what I've learned. He said, but this I remember, that I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. Yeah. Amen. Amen. What, a, what, a, what a way to leave this world, right? Yeah. Amen. You wasn't going to get that from him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3. There's all kinds of great hymns in these books, man. And what a lot of people don't know about them hymns is they were, they come off of the tongue of men who had learned through great tribulation the love of God. As Paul said in Romans 5, you don't ever know what, 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 what praise and thanksgiving has costed, some, has costed somebody. David said he wouldn't offer anything the Lord didn't cost him something. Yeah. And the writer of Hebrews tells him in chapter 13 to offer the praise of their lips continually unto God. And a lot of these songs came from people who earned those songs through sufferings and tribulation. And I tell you, man, I've, I've been, uh, what I'm going through now, I've been through before. And I, I tell you, I look back over my life and realize how much the grace of God has helped me to grow. Uh, when you're going through things like this, or he's real, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Two days after I lost my dad, I was standing in my, in my mom's living room crying tears of joy with thanksgiving unto God. I was laying over there the other day in the bed and started thinking about all that God's done for me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. And again, I say rejoice. Mm -hmm. Amen. Like I said, there's no love lost between me and the devil. And all I can say is God's going to bruise him under our feet shortly. Amen. Christ has already given us the victory, right. right? God always causes us to triumph. Mm -hmm. Just enjoy the ride, man. Amen. Trust in him and enjoy the ride. He'll always cause you to triumph. But Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 7 is where we are. And over the last couple of weeks, we've, we've really laid out the house of God. I think it's been, I, I, it's, it's been an interesting study for me because Paul mentions the house of God as well. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He says in chapter 3 that we are fellow heirs. So you and, I, you and us Gentiles who are outside and strangers to these things, you and I have been made heirs in the house of God as well. We are fellow heirs. We are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've, we've been talking about the household of God here in chapter 3, which is the subject here of Jesus Christ being a son over his own house. And, and he says in verse number 6, but Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? And if you look back in verse 4, that, that house is defined. For every house is built by some man, but he that built what? All things is God. So, so the house of God is all things. Right? You have the Father up there. And in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the book of Colossians tells us, that when he made these two realms, he created all things that are in heaven and all things that are in earth, both visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, might, dominion, or in any of those things. But these, everything created in heaven and everything created in earth, we now understand 
As God has, un, 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 has revealed to us his great plan and purpose, we know, now know that everything in heaven and everything in earth was created by Christ and for Christ. Every throne, dominion, principality, and power was created for Jesus Christ. Amen. Your New Testament is not about you. Your New Testament is about God's Son. That's what it's about. Amen. Paul begins Romans by saying he was separated unto the gospel of God concerning who? His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made after the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power uh, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Christ is now declared to be the Son of God. And everything that God made, He has given to His Son, Jesus Christ. He's the heir of everything. Now we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about God's rest as we come into chapter th the rest of Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. That rest is recorded all the way back in Genesis 2 too. Did y'all know that? God rested from everything that what? He had made. God, all the way back in Genesis, created everything in heaven and earth, and then he rested, and now he's, he's the writer of Hebrews is going to talk about entering into that rest. But God has already made his house, and his son is the heir of that house. Amen? Look at Acts chapter 7 real quick along these issues. Acts chapter 7. You know, every, everything God gave Israel back there under the Mosaic law was principles and shadows trying to teach them something much bigger. Right? If y'all really believe God was going to dwell in that little tent he told them to build out in the wilderness, that tent was a shadow of something heavenly. Now look here in Acts 7. Talking about the rest of God. Verse 47. Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Now there it is. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. So God rules over the earth from his throne in heaven and the earth is under his feet. It's his footstool. Then he says, what house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my what? Rest. Hath not my hand made all these things? You know, there's nothing more disgusting than a bunch of men born on this earth who refuse to give the creator of it the glory that he so deserves. Amen. Amen. He ought to be the most important thing in a family. He ought to be the most important thing in a school. He ought to be the most important thing in a government. He ought to be the most important thing in every aspect of man's life. Amen. I believe that. God made all these things. And his creatures, ever since he made it, everything in heaven and earth has sought to the best of their ability to get rid of him. You know what Paul said in Romans 1.28 about the Gentiles? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't even want him in their knowledge. They wanted to unlearn him. You know what God did? Gave him over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. But when we talk about the house of God, this is what we're talking about. It's massive. How many nations are in the earth? How many thrones, dominions, principalities? Right? How many city governments? How many, how many national governments, state governments, county governments? That's a massive place, right? That's not even counting what we can't see up here. What I know is there's an innumerable company of angels up there. I mean, the heavens and the earth, that's a massive house. And all of this, when we talk about the kingdom of God, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about everything that God made in heaven and earth and the administration of that, of that government. But what, what we now know and understand is that there's iniquity in this house, right? That iniquity was found first where? In Satan. 
And Satan, the poison, when Paul talks about the poison of ass being under their lips, you know how many people has drunk from the cup of devils and don't even realize it? You know how many people has been infected with the venom of that serpent and the iniquity of that serpent and don't even know it? You realize how many preachers in America stand behind pulpits who have the poison of asp under their lips. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that they being the ministers of Satan transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. They preach another Jesus, they give you another spirit, and they preach another gospel. And Paul said if you receive it, you might, bear, you might well bear with them. We can't do anything about it. But the reality is, guys, is we live in a creation now where that mystery of iniquity is real. Paul said it already works. And throughout his epistles, he warned you about that iniquity getting worse and worse and worse and more and more people departing from the faith, ungodliness increasing, evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. We were warned that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Amen? Amen? This is the house of God. And Jesus Christ was raised from the dead back here. Paul said he first descended into the lower parts of the what? Earth. He died on a cross and ascended up far above all heavens. That's Ephesians chapter 4. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, when God raised him from the dead, he said, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Jesus Christ is the first begotten from the dead and made the head of a new creature. Amen. He was declared to be God's son. He's been declared to be the heir of all things. You see, Christ don't just get Jerusalem. He gets the West Bank. He gets the Golan Heights. He gets Gaza. He gets clear out to the Euphrates. And if you don't like that, he gets the uttermost parts of the earth. He gets the heathen. And he gets all thrones, dominions, and principalities in heaven as well. He gets everything. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is God's son and heir of all things. Now, this gets into what the New Testament is about. Jesus Christ is now, guess what he is? He's the head of all principality and power. That means at some point in time, now we now the writer of Hebrews says, now we see not yet all things put under him. Satan, while Christ was on this earth, you know what the prince of the power of the air told him? He showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said, all this will I give you if you worship me, for they are mine, and I give them to who I will. You know, you know who decides? Who gets to run the show right now? Right now, Christ is up there seated, waiting for God to make his enemies. That means, while Christ is seated up here, there's all kinds of enemies in this place. And Christ is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool by God the Father. And when that day comes, Satan is going to lose that power that he now has. He's going to be wiped out. His place is not going to be found in heaven anymore. He's going to be cast down to the earth. Then they're going to cast him into a bottomless pit pit for a thousand years. And guess who gets to determine who gets what then? Jesus Christ gets to determine who gets what. That's why you're going to stand before a judgment seat of Christ one day. Christ is going to determine where he's going to put. We don't get to determine where God's going to put us. And all these little baby Christians running around that think that when Paul said, if we suffer, we shall reign, that that don't mean anything. It does. Christ is going to put Paul... I guarantee you he's going to put the Apostle Paul somewhere he ain't going to put some little baby Christian been running around for 60 years playing games with God. 
Now Christ is going to, what Christ is going to do, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Guys, I get excited talking about this stuff. So we, uh, every time I start talking about it, I get hung up. It's exciting though, man. Ain't you glad you know what you've been called into? It's wonderful to know that you're not going to hell. It's wonderful to know that your sins are forgiven. But guys, God has called us into something so much greater, man. Have you ever wondered what that eternal glory is? Have you ever wondered what the glory, being glorified together with Christ is? I mean, we've got a hope. When Paul writes to the Ephesians and said that you may know what is the hope of his calling, he's not talking about just having your sins forgiven. He's talking about the inheritance and the hope that we've been called into by God according to something he planned before the foundation of the world. Look at Ephesians 4. Why did Christ go back up to heaven? Look at Ephesians 4.10 or 4.9. Now that he ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. Now this is the difference. There are some beings up here that the book of Ephesians talks about being in high places. Right? But Christ ascended up far above all heavens. All these high places all these, these, this spiritual wickedness and all these principalities and powers that are now here, Jesus Christ ascended up far above all of them. Amen. He's been made the head of all that principality and power. And God has put all things under his feet. Now look at why he went up there. He said he ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Well, who's filling all things right now? It ain't him. Right? Amen. So there's coming a day when all these things in heaven and earth are going to be filled by God's Son. Now how's he going to do it? Come back to Ephesians chapter 1. Right there it is, verse 23. Tell me what his fullness is that filleth all in all. It's his body. Look at what he says, verse 22. It put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of who? Him that what? Fill with all in all. So if Christ is going to fill all things, how's he going to fill all things? With his body. He, he's the head, and God has given him a body to become his fullness. And it's going to be this body that fills all things. Now that tells you what you've been called into. Amen. You've been called so that Christ can use you as members of his body to fill all things. Now there's a heavenly aspect to this and an earthly aspect to this. Now why is, why is God doing this? Well look at Colossians. So you know what phase you're in right now? I, I talked about this last week, and this, this gets into Hebrews also, guys. I don't want you to think that we're not dealing with stuff in Hebrews. You've got to get these distinctions. Right now we are in a gathering stage. God is gathering out of all nations right now, Jew and Gentile. To reconcile them in one body back to him. Amen. Now when, when this body is done. Christ is going to use that body. To fill all things. Right? Now what's going to happen then? We'll look at Colossians. 1.20 Having made peace through the blood of his cross. By him to what? Reconcile. All things unto himself, whether they be things in earth or things where. So Christ, Christ is now, there's a gathering for the purpose of filling all things. And when those things are all filled with the fullness of Christ, all those things are going to be reconciled back to God. Amen? The rebels are going to be purged. 
Right? That, that verse over there in Haggai, I love this verse. God said, speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and tell him yet once more, shake I not the earth only, but heaven also, and I will remove the throne of kingdoms. There's a throne up here in heaven that reigns over the kingdoms of this earth, and God one day is going to shake the whole thing, and Hebrews 12 tells you it's to remove those things that are shaken. You see stars falling, you see everything. God is going to remove that whole corrupt kingdom out of his house and then his son is going to fill that house with reconciled people for the purpose of reconciling God's creation back to God. That's exciting. Amen. Next time you pick up a sword of the Lord and start reading through it, ask yourself, what are these guys even talking about? They don't have any idea where they're at or what they're doing, man. And I mean that stuff. Now, the last phase is in Galatians chapter 1. And we know this one. Or Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 1. So there's a gathering in Christ. This is why these people get all bent out of shape. You know, when we say... That this one began with Paul. And they're like, well, Paul said there was people in Christ before him. No kidding, Sherlock. Yeah. Everything's got, I mean, I mean, is God allowed to gather things in earth in Christ? Guess what? Is Israel, is Israel, is the Israel of God in Christ? Yes. So is this one up here. Right? But that Jew knew nothing about this stuff right here. All right, now why is God gathering things in the Christ? It's to fill all things in heaven and earth for the purpose of reconciling all those things. And then when all things are subdued, he's going to gather both heaven and earth together in one out there in the ages to come, in the fullness of times. That's what God the Father's plan is. Over the next, at least, 1,007 years, at least. Then we go off into eternity. But this is what God is doing in the process of time that you're now in. So what is your New Testament about? Your New Testament is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The heir of all things. God the Father ain't going to have any problem casting you or any of your kinfolk out. He don't have a problem with it. This old, this old God, the God of love and all that stuff that the hippies and the liberals always talking about, God ain't going to have a problem removing about 7 billion people from heaven and earth. He don't have a problem with it at all. There's only one way to come to God the Father and it's right there. God will get rid of 30 million Muslims. He'll get rid of 3.5 billion Hindus and Buddhists. He don't care. Now, he wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't get me wrong on that. But there's coming a day in which God is going to remove a lot of things from heaven and earth for the purpose of his son becoming the heir and filling that creation. And so Christ, God's son, the heir of all things, is now the head of all principality and power in heaven and earth. And the New Testament is about this son, the heir of all things in heaven and earth. And this inheritance has two parts to it. Right? How many places did God create? Two. So when you're talking about the heir of all things, that means Christ has an inheritance in two places. And you can find this stuff back in Genesis. Don't tell a mid-Acts dispensationalist I said that, but you can. Abraham's seed shall be as the dust of the what? And the stars of what? There you go. Amen? Paul said, there is a celestial body and bodies what? Terrestrial. Heavenly, earthly bodies. And the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So also is the resurrection of the dead. You know what that tells me? In the resurrection of the dead, there are celestial and heavenly bodies. That means somebody's getting resurrected into a heavenly body, guys. And it can't be the angels because the resurrection don't pertain to angels. 
Amen. The first man is of the what? Earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from where? Christ has two titles in that, in that chapter. The last Adam, that's earthy, and the second man. He, as the last Adam, he wasn't the second man. Getting that? He was the last of Adam. As the second man, he's the Lord from heaven. And as we have bore the image of the earthy, so also shall we bear the image of who? The heavenly. There it is. Now, in this inheritance, there's two parts. There's a dispensational part to it. These heavenly places up here are going to be inherited by the new man. Right? The heavenly, Christ has a heavenly inheritance up here. And right now, in the dispensation you live in, God is creating in Christ a new man. We are his workmanship created in when you start understanding this, you're going to understand what Paul means, that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God is creating a new creature. This is why we don't know any man after the flesh anymore. Though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now know we him no more. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We are a new creation of God being created in Christ, but what's its purpose? What's the purpose of this new creature? It's to inherit those heavenly places. God is creating a new man right now for the purpose of inheriting the heavenly places. And all of this is in accordance, it's in accordance to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Look at Ephesians 1. Boy, if you're ever feeling down in the dumps, if you're ever feeling just... Uh, if this world's ever got you down, man, and this world, this world's just a garbage place, man. I went to pick up my son from just five seconds out in the world, you're ready to go burn your clothes and bathe in gasoline, man. I swear it. I went and picked my son up from school today and pulled up a middle school, man. There's 10, 11, 12 year old kids attending school there. And a guy pulled out of the parking lot with a big F Biden flag waving in his truck, which Man, if you want to parade down the streets like an idiot, you go right ahead, man. But that's no, there's children there. Then I walked in the office to sign him out, and there was a mother in there raising cane, just cussing like a sailor, and little kids all in that office. I'd have loved just, uh, I, I, don't, I won't tell you what I'd love to have done. But it's, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's. When you, when you get, when you, the point I'm making, guys, when you get like that, just look, look at Ephesians 1 4. That everything God has given us in Christ and heavenly places, I believe it's there, man. I believe it's mine. I'm not waiting to see what's going to happen when I die. I know where I'm at, who I am, and what God has given me in His Son. And, you, and, and there ain't nothing in time. That can happen in time. Things present nor things to come. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because what he gave me in Christ. Was according to him choosing us in Christ. Before the foundation of the world. You ain't going to knock God off of this man. What he freely gave me in his son. He gave me according to him choosing me in his son. Before the foundation of the world. That I should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us to the adoption of children. Man. Now look what that was according to. The good pleasure of his will. He didn't ask anybody's permission. And he don't need your repentance. He don't need your tears. He don't need any of that stuff. He determined he was going to do it. Before you ever drew your first breath. And where were you at when his son shed his blood to redeem you? Get over yourself. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he, he, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Look at 1.11. In whom also we've obtained an inheritance. 
being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So way back here, guys, God predestinated us to adoption and inheritance. And then you know what he did? He kept his mouth shut about it for 4,000 years. He kept it secret because had, had this spiritual wickedness in high places had known about this, they wouldn't have crucified him there. And then when Christ went up here and sat down, God then dispensed back to the Apostle Paul the great mystery that he had kept secret and that is that you and I according to God's predestinated purpose according to his own grace his own love his own mercy he had chosen us to become his adopted children for the purpose of inheriting these heavenly places up here. Now, now, Satan's, keeping it a mystery. now Satan's trying to keep it secret. Yep, he has, Gary. <laughs> it's like a vampire, you know. Vampire can't come in unless you invite them, you know. <laughs> I hate to be like that, man, but the religious world is so messed up. I, I, I'll tell y'all a story, tell you a story, man, I, I asked them, got a call one time, another church I was passing, a lady said, this boy just got saved, we'd like to, for you to go visit him, I was like, okay, so I went down with my deacon, and we started talking to the boy, and I started asking him some questions, I was like, so I heard you got saved, yeah, I was like, you sure you're going to go to heaven when you die, he said, well, I hope so, I said, well, what are you trusting in to get you there? He said, I don't know. I beat around the bush a little bit more. I said, if God asked you one reason he should let you into, he into heaven, what would your answer be? He said, well, I don't know. I was like, how did you get saved? He said, I just went to the altar and prayed all day till I got through. Yeah. Yeah. You know where he got led to the Lord, don't you? Dorothy, full gospel. Yep. Pentecostal church. Don't have the sense God gave a brass monkey. Amen? And I mean it. So I gave the boy the gospel. I said, ain't no hoping to it, man. I gave the boy the gospel. What do you think about that? Boy, go to a church and get saved, and all they can do is get him up there snotting and snorting on an altar for three hours till he feels something. Amen? And then somebody like that when I try to go witness to them, I got to cleanse and fight through all the religious garbage to try to get that person to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I get so aggravated with this stuff, man. The last thing Fairmont needs is a is hundred churches, guys. You don't need that many churches in this town. They're just adding to the confusion. Part of it's the, uh, listen, all the churches in this area, if you can't figure it out, mystery of iniquity. First Baptist church down there got a lesbian in the pulpit. Mystery of iniquity. Right? Now, let's get on this. You see that? That's part of the inheritance there. That one had been kept secret. And the only way you're going to learn about this one is to read the, the dispensation given to Paul for us. The major, what's wrong with the Christian world today is they're reading everything dealing with this. Yep. Yep. Amen? Now there is a, this one up here is dispensational. Now there's, a part, there's an inheritance of Christ that's according to the covenants made with Israel. This one up here is according to the to the seek the revelation of the mystery that had been kept secret since the world began. This inheritance down here in the earth is according to the scriptures of the prophets that have spoken since the world began. Now that's not hard to figure out. Look at Ephesians chapter four. Well, it is hard to figure out, but you got you got to study the Bible to and take it serious from time to time. 
Look at Ephesians 4. I remember the first time somebody asked me if anybody in the Old Testament ever talked about going to heaven. I was like, well, of course they did. Then I, they was like, where? I started looking for it. There ain't nobody in the Old Testament talking about going to heaven. Their hope was here. And all God revealed in the Old Testament was about an inheritance in the earth. This right here was completely kept secret. This new man for the purpose of this inheritance. Look at Ephesians 4.1. And then we're going to jump back to Hebrews. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Why is he a prisoner? Well look back in 3.1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now he's beseeching us as the prisoner of the Lord. He said, I beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So when, when we got saved, guys, when we heard the gospel of our salvation, God took us and sealed us up here in Jesus Christ as a part of this new man. Now you've got to understand what the new man's being created for. Adoption and inheritance. Now this new man, when it's completed, you and I are being called up to meet the Lord in the air. But when we were called in to this, there was a purpose behind it. That in the ages to come, we've got some things to do, right? When you go up to heaven, you're going up to heaven to do something for God. You're not going up there to lounge around and relax and hang out and do nothing for the next 10 billion millennia. There's a job to do up there. I've got, I've got news for a lot of Christians, man, and I hate to be mean about this, man, but if all you've done is waved your hands around for the last 30 years and ain't never learned any Bible, God ain't got a whole lot for you. Study to show yourself approved unto God a what? Workman. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. All scriptures given and is profitable that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. You know what the new man's being created for? We've been created in Christ unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yes, amen? We've got something to do. Not only here, as you start to understand the will of God, you understand what to do now. But you understand what God has called you to in the future as well. This is what, understanding this is why Paul said, he said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Life or death didn't phase Paul. Why? His expectation and his hope. I press toward the mark for the prize of the what? High calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? So there's a, there's a vocation there. Now come to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Now remember, I just showed you there's two of them. Right? Christ is the heir of all things. He's got a heavenly inheritance and an earthly inheritance. And his job is to feel these things. Right? Now, you and I have been called into Christ for the purpose of inheriting and filling the things in the heavenly places. What about the earthly things? Well, look at Hebrews 3.1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So now here's another calling. And we know this is another calling. As we, as we go down through here, what is, what is he talking about? Right? Your, your calling and your vocation was according to something God had kept secret since the world began. Israel's calling and profession has not been kept secret since the world began. Amen. They have a land. They have a kingdom. They have a throne. They have a law. They have a book. 
God, God gave all that stuff to that nation. One of the first chapters of your Bible, I will make of thee a great nation. And unto thee and thy seed have I given this land. That has nothing to do with the heavenly places. And if you think God, like, like the modern scholars do, oh, well, they just didn't, and they, they just didn't understand what God really meant. And they spiritualized the whole Bible. And they say there is no physical kingdom. There is, the church got all those promises, and that we got to spiritualize the whole book. There's a calling down here also, guys. These covenants. Paul said that in the mystery, Israel was partially blind until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And then every Jew and Gentile that's been reconciled to God in one body is going to be caught up together for this purpose up here. And then all Israel shall be saved as it is written. That's prophecy. And Hebrews is now, now that you've come out of Paul's epistles, where do you think you are? Now that you come to a book called Hebrews, not a Gentile name, doesn't begin with the word Paul. Now that you're in a book called Hebrews, do you think you're dealing with mystery or prophecy? What's prophecy about, heaven or earth? Now do you know why you don't find a rapture in Hebrews? Now do you know why you don't find a rapture in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, or Revelation? The one event they're all talking about in those Hebrew epistles is the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the rapture. Amen. All right? And so when this thing's all said and done, after the day of the Lord, when Christ cleanses both realms, heaven and earth, shakes heaven and earth and fills heaven and earth with reconciled sons of God. Right? Then he, there are sons down here in the earth too, Israel. To Israel pertains the adoption and the glory. This heavenly government is going to be operated out of Jerusalem. The gate of heaven. And the whole heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, and this reconciled government of heaven and through the nation of Israel is going to be ministered in the earth. All right? Now, look at Hebrews 3, 6. The calling and the profession of Israel. He says, Christ as a son over his own house. You realize God kicked Israel out of his house, right? How many of y'all knew that God married Israel? How many of you knew that he gave her a divorce? How many of you knew that he stripped her naked and threw her back out in the place where he found her? All these fundamentalists running around talking about divorce, 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 divorce. God divorced. And pre these fundamentalists wouldn't let God preach in their church. Amen. God was divorced. He wrote Israel a writing of divorcement and said, give me my corn, give me my oil, give me my wine, give me my wool, give me my flax, and get out of my house and go let your lovers and your other gods take care of you now. He said, and your children, which are not mine, and your sons, which are not mine, they can go to. They're not my people, and I will not have mercy on them. Out they went. Now, God is going to keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But not all Israel is Israel. But God is taking the believing remnant of that nation and going to make the nation that he promised Israel out of them. And God's son is going to be the son over that house of Israel one day. And this is what he's talking about. He says, Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are what? We. Well, who's the we in the context? It's Israel. If, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now, I'm going to spend some time here on this if, because this is where, you, this is where people get in trouble. I don't believe... 
the way you got to read those Hebrew epistles, guys, is they're written to a whole nation of people, right? I don't believe it's going to be easy, just as easy to lose salvation as people think. The Hebrew epistles are not as scary as people make them. Once you understand what they're talking about. In that nation, in that nation of people, of course, there's believers and unbelievers. Right? And once you understand that, you can't read Hebrews like it's written to a bunch of justified people. It's written to a nation. Look at how Christ talked to the nation of Israel sometimes. Amen? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? He's talking to a nation. The writer of Hebrews, who's it written to? Hebrews. Right? A nation who God had spoken to in time past has now spoken to them by His Son. And here's what He's saying. Now listen, when He says Christ as a Son over His own house, that's going to happen out here at the second coming. Let's get a little timeline here. There's the rapture. Then the second coming out here. And then in the world to come, they are going to become the house over which Christ inherits and reigns over. Now in order to become that house, they have to hold something fast unto the what? End. Now that proof positive to me that it can, this epistle can only be about one generation of Jews. You think a Jew saved today? If what he has to make it to here? The book of Hebrews will not be applicable, guys, until after God has done doing what He's doing today through Paul's dispensation. And the book of Hebrews will have an application to the nation of Israel as they go through the last of Daniel's seventy weeks prior to the kingdom being established. And they have a calling out here to become the house of God and to be a part of this house that Christ is going to reign over if they make it to here. But there's a danger. What you've got to understand about this is that it's conditional. Becoming this house out here for Israel is conditional. They are in danger of not receiving this inheritance. In other words... Just because you're a circumcised, blood-born, natural citizen of Israel does not guarantee you entrance into that kingdom. Was Esau a son of Isaac? In Isaac shall thy what? Seed be called. You know what Esau sold? His birthright. He sold the inheritance for a morsel of meat. You know how easy that's going to be to do in the tribulation period? Man can't eat, can't buy or sell except he have a mark. Amen. Now, now look at look at look here at Hebrews. Now, you gotta if you understand that Daniel seventy weeks is the time of Jacob's trouble when Christ was cut off here after sixty nine weeks. The everything that pertains to Israel moving forward is about a time of trouble. So you've got to remain, read the remainder of their epistles. Hebrews through Revelation as it pertains to that time of trouble that's been prophesied about Israel. Amen. Right. Amen. And if you forget that there's a tribulation coming and you don't have the tribulation in the back of your mind as you're reading these Hebrew epistles, it's not going to make any sense to you. Why is the writer of Hebrews telling them to endure chastening? I know how Baptist preachers have used Hebrews 12 for years. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with what? Sons. But if you be without chastisement, whereof well, all partakers, then are ye bastards. And not what? Sons. That deals with inheritance. The same way Christ endured the cross and then got this glory up here, if they endure chastening, they're going to inherit this glory. If they don't endure it, they're bastards and God will treat them like bastards. 
Amen. They're in danger. Look at Hebrews, look at Hebrews 3.14. Heard a Baptist preacher. I was watching YouTube last night. Now I'm going to be shutting up here in a second, but I was watching a Baptist preacher preach on Hebrews last night. And he got to Hebrews and he said, the rest of these epistles are general Christian epistles. I was like, eh, strike one. And then he, 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 started, he started going, trying to explain Hebrews and, and 1 Peter, and he was just all over the place, man. And I want you to look at Hebrews 3.14. For we are made partakers of Christ. Who's the we? It's Hebrews. Right? Don't make it anything that it's not. He says, for we are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the what? There it is again. They'll be made partakers of Christ here at the end here but they've got to get through this now do you think Hebrews 3.14 is about you you're only made a partaker of Christ if did Paul not say for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bone did he not say that you're raised up and seated together with him in heavenly places did he not say that you're sealed in the Son of God unto the day of redemption? Amen. That can't be the same. Look at Hebrews 4.1. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. That's this out here. If a promise of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come what? What's going to keep them from entering in? Same thing that kept their fathers from entering in. Unbelief. Look at, look at Hebrews 6.6. 6. Now you've got, you've got two things. Well, I, I, I'm not going to expound these verses because we'll get to them eventually. What I want you to see is the danger here. They're, they're in danger of not of not becoming the house out here. They're in danger of not partaking of Christ. They're in danger of coming short of entering into his rest. Look at verse 6. If they shall fall away. So they're in danger of falling away. And then it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. Because what have they done? They've crucified the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It's a, it's a fresh, it's a fresh, they will take the mark, Gary, but it's, it's, it's a fresh denial and rejection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this Jew has, this Jew was once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, made a partaker of the Holy Ghost. It's completely different than our dispensation. A man that gets the Holy Spirit today can grieve the Spirit, but he's still sealed by that Spirit to the day of redemption. Whoever this is about was a partaker of the Holy Ghost and then fell away. Yeah. Right? Look at, uh, and I don't pretend to understand these verses completely, but look at, look at Hebrews 6, 12. It's all through this epistle. It just amazes me, the Baptist preachers that believe in eternal security that read Hebrews and still thinks it's about us. Look at Hebrews 6, 12, that ye be not slothful. Well, look at verse 11. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto when. Their hope is here. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Look at, uh, it's the promises of Abraham. Amen, Doris. Look at, look at Hebrews 10, 26, because Abraham's going to show up in that text also in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we, there it is again. For if we sin willfully, now notice this, Israel, now when Paul sinned, you know what he did? He sinned ignorantly. 
In Acts 7, he said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Israel is still in unbelief to this day. There's a time, right now, Israel is still in that blindness. It began in Isaiah 6. You got This stuff goes back for centuries with Israel. This willful sin cannot be committed by Israel until after they have received the knowledge of the truth. Now, once, now Israel has three things, guys. They stumbled in Acts. They fell in Acts 7. Out here in this period here is what is going to be that falling away. Once that falling away happens, they cannot be renewed again under repentance. This is not something that you and I can go through in our dispensation. These things pertain to Israel. God sent them that, that rock. He become a rock of offense. They stumbled over that rock. They fell in Acts 7. Out here, if they fall away, that rock is going to fall on them and grind them to powder one day. Amen? Now, this willful sin is after they have received the knowledge of the truth. And then he tells them in, in verse 29 what that willful sin is. Look over and look in 1038. Just look at all the ifs, man. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw what? My soul shall have no pleasure in him. What happens to them that draw, draw back? They draw back unto what? Perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the what? There you go. Look at Hebrews 12. One more place. Hebrews 12, 20, uh, 12, 25. Let's look at that one. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake where? On earth. That's Moses. The prophets. You could even throw the prophets in there. Right? For if they escape not him that spake on earth... That's the specific thing is when God came down and spoke on Mount Sinai. But look at what he says. He says, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from where? That's the heavenly calling. Christ has now went back as a high priest. And now he's, listen guys, and we're going to get into this stuff as we come into Hebrews 9 and 10. You know when the high priest went in once a year into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the nation of Israel that no man was allowed to enter the tabernacle until he reappeared? Did y'all know that? Well, where's Christ at? Is he in the Holy of Holies? Did he go there to make atonement for the nation of Israel? Then guess what? Israel has no right to enter into the earthly tabernacle and sanctuary while he's there. Amen? And this is what the writer of Hebrews is, is talking about. He appeared once to put away sin by the sacrifice of, of himself and has now went back to appear in the presence of God for us and unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. The picture there is the day of atonement for Israel. And when Christ comes back here, the atonement that he's made for them is going to bring them into that new covenant that's going to last forever in that land. Right? One, one final thing. Look back at Hebrews 3 and I'll close. Look back at Hebrews 3. <sighs> What I want you to get right now, our calling's here, Israel's calling is here on the earth when Christ returns. And before that time comes, Israel's going to go through this 70th week and they're going to have to hold fast and endure unto the end here. And so when he says that if we hold fast, the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope the hope there refers back to the heavenly calling. And this is going to lead us into Hebrews 3, 7 next week. 
Because what they're going to have to hold fast is a hope. And that hope that they're holding fast comes from this calling of the Son of God to become the heirs and inherit this world to come. And so they're going to have to endure this period of time looking for this hope here. And they get that hope from the calling. That's why verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his what? His voice. Right? And so the hope is the hope of their calling as, as receiving the internal, eternal inheritance in the land of Israel and the house of God under the new covenant in the world to come. Once they enter into it here, they're never going to lose it again. That new covenant is everlasting. But they've got to make it to here. And if they count the blood of this new covenant an unholy thing, trot underfoot the Son of God, fall away, draw back, get hardened through sin and unbelief, they're not going to enter in up here. Right? And then he says unto the end, and, and now once, once you understand everything I'm laying out here, guys, that phrase, the end there, once you understand it, you will see that this proves beyond all doubt that Hebrews is for the generation of Israel living in the last days of the 70 weeks that's been term, determined upon that. Y'all think God's done with those 70 weeks? You think, you think that after the Messiah was cut off here, he just took that final seven-year period and was like, no, nah, I'm just kidding, I ain't going to do that anymore. It's coming. Now, thank God for the mystery he had tucked in here that shows us his long-suffering for mankind, having mercy upon all men for 2,000 years, but this 70th week is coming. And when that 70th week comes, there's going to be a message preached to the nation of Israel concerning their coming kingdom again, this world to come, and they're going to have to endure this period. And, and, and this just proves that, that, that this book applies to Israel living in the last days of the times determined upon them just prior to the second coming of Christ. How can, how can you say, if you make it to the end, to generations that have died for the last 2,000 years. You can only speak that way, guys, to a generation of people. Christ said the same thing, Matthew 24, he that endures unto the... Right? You can only speak that way to the people that's going to be living in the last days prior to the second coming. And this, this is the theme that you're going to see throughout Hebrews, 1 Peter, and onward... Is, is this theme of the second coming of Christ. They're not preaching this. And this is where everybody's so confused with the rapture today. They're looking for the rapture in Revelation. Revelation 4.1, Revelation 7, Revelation 11, Revelation 12. The man child, the two witnesses called up in Revelation 11. There's the rapture. The man child, Revelation 12. No, that's the rapture. John being called up in 4.1 is the rapture. There's no rapture in Revelation. The seven letters to the seven churches, how can it be about church history when every church is looking for that event right there? If you will not repent, I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place. Church of Pergamos, if you don't repent, I'll come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Church at Thyatira, those that commit adultery with that whore, I'm going to put them into great tribulation. And those of you who have not known this doctrine, what you have already, hold fast till what? I come. Church of Philadelphia, that which you have, hold fast till I come. Let no man take thy crown. And all seven churches are looking for the second coming. Hebrews is preaching the second coming. Unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time. He says in Hebrews 10, 37, it is a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Yep. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised once more shake I not the earth only, but heaven also. That's in the day of the Lord. Hebrews 12 is quoting a verse about the day of the Lord, which takes place up here. 
Amen. First Peter, what does first Peter say? He says, gird up the loins of your mind. He's preaching the same thing Hebrews is. Gird up the loins of your mind and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, do y'all think that's you? <laughs> you, and I, you and I are looking for a completely different hope. Paul said our conversation is in from whence also we look for the Savior who shall change our vile bodies that they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Right? Israel's conversation is here. And they're looking for the, re, the Lord to return to the earth to restore the kingdom to Israel. Amen. Any questions on any of this? I know it's a lot. Their hard time is just ready to come. They ain't even right now. No. That's seven, seven, seven years of tribulation. Seven years. And, and see, what, what the, book, the book of Hebrews is going to deal with all that stuff like the... Because the Jews, I mean, all through their Old Testament, they were... Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. And the writer of Hebrews is going to emphasize that Abraham was looking for that city whose builder and maker was God. But what he's going to show them is that that city is a heavenly city. You've not come into the mountain which might be touched, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. And then he's going to tell them to flee. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And so it's, it's all about educating Israel for this period of time out here to help them to understand what's taken place since Jesus Christ died on the cross, to give them the understanding of this, of the better things that they have in Christ, a better city coming, just all that stuff. But, but right now, we'll, we'll pick up next week with uh, here in Hebrews 3, 7, where he says he's going to contrast today with the day of temptation in the wilderness He's going to contrast this generation that Christ is speaking to here about entering into his rest back to the generation under Moses who received that same gospel and that same message. And that tells me that this period out here is going to resemble that period back there a lot. And that will help you to understand Revelation 12 when you get to it. And that's why Psalm 78 says that that story back there is a parable. <laughs> it's a real it really happened but the writer the right the psalmist said that these things back here are a parable of something coming in the future That's, what, that's, that's going to happen. That's going to happen to them here. Yeah. It's going to happen to them again. By, by, by the time it's all said and done, Doris, a very small remnant yeah. Yeah. of this nation is going to make it to this period. Now, there's going to be a resurrection of, of, of the, those that slept back there, Moses, Samuel, Daniel, all those old saints back there. But out of this generation here, it's going to be a very small remnant that comes through that period yeah. and makes it in, in, unto the end. Starts it over there, like you said, Moses, you know, that tree of life. Mm -hmm. Back here, tree of life is there. Yep. And see, that, that, I mean, God ain't done with his law either. No, no. The, the, Israel is going to govern the nations with that law of God. The law of the Lord is going to go out of Jerusalem. He ain't done with the law. Is that uh, that year of mercy that he extended, culminating with the stoning of Stephen? Is that reckoned in Daniel? Don't, it don't appear to be, but you can find it. I've, I've come to realize you can find it in Isaiah also. The acceptable year of the Lord, he talks about it in Isaiah 61. And there may, it also may reference a period of time out here too, Dave. I've been, I've been looking for it and trying to, that today, today if you hear his voice, there may be a period of time out here prior to the day of vengeance beginning because that's what was supposed to happen. Acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God. Now they got that acceptable year here and then God revealed this mystery. So the day of vengeance didn't come.
but that today, if you hear his voice, there may be another acceptable year out here in which God offers Israel these things prior to the day of vengeance beginning. But it's, it, it's not reckoned into Daniel 70 weeks, no. It was kind of like a break, and God does that all the time. There would be no comfort in that 70th week. Excuse me, I mean, there'd just be a turmoil and chaos. The, the, There, 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 there's, there's two groups that, that, that you got to distinguish. There's actually three groups. You got the man child in Revelation 12. That's, that's a strange puppy there at 144,000 called up to Mount Zion. Then you've got the woman that brought her forth going into the wilderness. Now she's going to be protected. But this is why Christ says, watch that you may be counted worthy to escape. And then he tells the church of Philadelphia, I've set before you an open door. Man, this stuff goes back to Jose. I will give them the, the valley of Achor for a door of hope. They're going to flee out of the land the same way they entered the land in Joshua, through, through the valley of Achor. So that woman, that woman will be protected, Bill, in the wilderness. But those who don't, those who don't get to escape out into the wilderness, the ones that are left to go through, this final half of the 70th week of Daniel, it's going to get bad for him. And, but, and, and so there, there's going to be Jews that, that Satan, when he, can't, when he can't get to the woman, he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed that is still scattered. And so the woman will be protected, but there's going to be Jews that don't make it into the wilderness that if they want to get to here, it's going to cost them their life. And that's in Daniel. It says, many of them who understand shall fall to try them and to make them white until the time of the end. And so it's, 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 well, I mean, I hope we can get through a lot of this stuff, guys. I, I love studying prophecy. I do. Even though I'm a dispensational, I still love this stuff. But like when you, when you read Revelation, and I'm surprised that no preacher has ever said anything about this, the sixth church, Philadelphia, has an open door the seventh church, Christ stands at the door and knocks. And why no preacher, while they're busy talking about Baptist history and all this other stuff, they never notice the references to the open door and him standing at the door and knocking in back-to-back -back churches. And then they couldn't find the references to the Gospel of Luke on that. He says, he says watch so that when the, man, the master returneth from the wedding and knocketh, they may open up to him immediately. That's the knocking at the door of the church at Laodicea. But they're too busy talking about Baptist and Catholic history and everything else to get what's really being talked about there in Revelation. But did that, did that answer your question, Bill, about well, having no comfort? There's another thing there that said that no flesh would survive if these days were not short, shortened. And then, I, then you just said the 144,000. I thought that that might give them a, some kind of a reprieve, so yeah. to speak. What, if he says it's going to go seven years. what I believe is, is, is if you read Hosea, and this, this will get back here, Israel had, that, that woman had two children, Loamai and Lo Rahum, I think is how, I don't know if you spell it like that. But then in chapter two, he changes their names to Ammi and Rahumah. So, so these children are now his children, the ones who he says are not my children and I will not have mercy. In chapter 2, he changes their name and says, Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, I will have mercy. And then he says, Plead with your mother, for she is not my wife. So that, that, that mother brings forth children that are God's. Right? That woman produces a man-child in Revelation 12. And I, this is my personal belief. I believe that man child is a remnant. I personally believe it's the 144,000. And I believe they are called up to the throne of God at the halfway point of the tribulation. Right? The woman who gave birth to them, 
that, that woman who God says, she is not my wife. He tells them, he says in Hosea 2, I will allure her into the wilderness and I will speak comfortably to her. So that, that unconverted nation, the woman, is going to go out into the wilderness at this point. And then there's still the remnant of her seed scattered among the nations that Satan goes to persecute. But I believe that wedding, the marriage with the woman, takes place in the wilderness during the last half of this tribulation period. That's, that's the ones who go to the wedding and the door is shut. Then Christ here is like a man coming back from the wedding who knocks at the door. So the church at Philadelphia gets the open door to go out here. And those who don't get to escape, they can still be saved, but they have to be watching and ready to open the door when the master returns from the wedding. So this out here is the marriage supper. The marriage must take place before then. Blessed are they called to the marriage supper, right? That's, that's the suppers out here in the kingdom. The marriage takes place in the wilderness when God brings them into the bond of the new covenant. Go ahead, Doris. I don't know where they are. I mean, the Saudi Arabians seem to be descendants of, of, of Abraham and Ishmael. They're, they're, they're going to be blessed out here, no doubt about it. They're going to receive an inheritance out here. It's just everybody reads hell in the Bible, Doors. They, they see cast out the bond woman and they just say, oh, they went to hell. That's not how the Bible is. He shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So he's going to, he's going to be heir and receive an inheritance, but he's just not going to be heir with Isaac. So they're, they're, they are going to receive something out here in the kingdom. Uh, all, all those, I mean, a lot of the nations are going to receive inheritances. I mean, I believe when Christ separates the nations, he, he gathers all nations and he, he'll go through the nation of Moab and he'll pick out the, the, the goats and the sheep and then he'll gather another nation, Germany, and pick out the sheep and the goats from that nation. Then the goats are going to be cast out and the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom that's been prepared. It's, 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 it's a wonderful book, man. It's a blessed book. I love it. Hey, man, any more questions? And I enjoy this, guys. I mean, I'd love to have whole services, man. I, I would love for Sunday school to just be a question and answer. If, uh, if y'all would ever want to do it, but y'all got to ask the questions. <laughs> Wait. Sheep is mild and obedient too. Uh, the, on, the only thing a sheep will follow other than the voice of its master though is a goat. It's true. The way they lead sheep into the slaughterhouse is with a goat. That sheep will follow a goat clear to the slaughterhouse. Maze Jackson told a story one time. You know Maze Jackson, Bill. He was talking about being in Israel and he said two, sheep, two shepherds we're out there. He was walking the Holy Land. He said two shepherds walked up, and he said there was he said there were six hundred sheep, man, just mingled in together there. And he, he said them two shepherds sat there and talked for a little bit. And Maze Jackson said, "I just sat back and said I want to see how they clean this mess up. All these sheep mixed in together." Then he said them two shepherds when they got done talking, they just they just parted ways and and cried out with their voice, and all the sheep knew their master's voice, and they all separated and followed the master. Christ, I mean, Christ knew what he was talking about when he said, my sheep hear my voice, right? But interesting stuff, man. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings of life, God. You're so good to us. Just, uh, I just love you and thank you for, for all that you are and all that you do and all that you have done and have planned and purposed, God. We know as you told Abraham that you had made him a father of many nations while he was still, he had no heir. And Father, we know that the things you've promised and the things that you've spoken in your, in your word, Father, are as good as done. Uh, you call things that are not as though they are, Father. You've told us that we're seated in heaven, we're seated in Christ, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. And 
And we're fully persuaded, Father, and we want to give you the glory of, of believing you and being persuaded that what you promised you're able to perform. And God, I just ask that you be with these people here, Father, that you would continue to develop our understanding of this blessed book that you've given us, Lord, to, to, to open our eyes, to behold the, uh, the, the, the glory of your Son as he now sits in heaven, Father, that we may be transformed into that same image, uh, that we may become more like him and have him more perfectly formed in us and perfected in us, Father, for the coming day. Uh, that we're going to be presented to you for your plan and purpose of, of reconciling heaven. God, I, I pray for my wife, Lord, you know the whole situation. And, and Father, just, just make, make me, help me to be a patient man and a loving man and just to be what she needs me to be at this time. And, and God, I just ask you uh, to even so come quickly. But, but Father, we just ask that you keep everybody safe, bring them back safely Sunday, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.